episode six, we're talking about transatlantic transphobia. Again, our favorite topic. It's me, Clementine. And who else do we have on the host mic with us today? It's me, Lizzie. Very excited to be with you here today, Lizzie. We got some fun stuff to talk about, as well as some serious stuff, but we'll get through it together. And hopefully everybody listening along with us has a bit of fun too. Hopefully. So starting off with a bit of a heavy topic, let's talk about the 11th Circuit endorsing forced sterilization to get an updated driver's license in the state of Alabama. <sighs> The 11th Circuit Court of Appeals recently reversed a lower court ruling that had been blocking Alabama from implementing a rule that would require transgender Alabamians to undergo sterilizing sex reassignment surgeries before they could update their driver's licenses with their correct gender markers. So instead of filling out the paperwork and just getting your updated driver's license, they're like, you need proof of surgery to get this. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a lot, right? And the rule got challenged in 2018. Three trans women in Alabama ended up suing, right? So these women all testified in court about the discrimination they faced because their IDs didn't match their lived genders. So you show up someplace like looking like a woman and then you get carded and it says male on it. And all of a sudden the transphobia starts to come out. One woman, a firefighter, was barricaded in a hot room and left with third-degree burns while her colleagues called her a freak. Another lost her job after presenting a driver's license that did not match her gender identity. A third was ridiculed by a driver's license exam administrator when it became clear that her gender marker differed from her identity. <sighs> I don't know about you, but it seems pretty obvious to me that there's some discrimination going on here and that it seems to happen pretty severely and immediately after they get their ID checked, right? Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. So basically, this takes a while to get through court, right? And so they filed suit in 2018 at the lower court in Alabama, starting uh -huh. in the state level. It works its way up into the federal courts. And in 2021, a federal district court ruled that Alabama's policy was unconstitutional and that it violated the three trans women's equal protection rights. So this decision got appealed by Alabama because that's their right. That's how the courts work. They're allowed to appeal things, apparently. But they appealed it to the 11th Circuit. So unfortunately, a number of the appeals courts have been, like, filled with a bunch of lifetime Trump appointees in recent years. Uh -huh. Not as much with the Biden administration, obviously, but Biden has been a bit slower than Trump to appoint judges, which is unfortunate. A lot of these seats got filled, and certain circuits, like the 11th, so that's the set of courts covering Florida, Alabama, and Georgia, and the 6th Circuit Court of Appeals covering Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee, have started to consistently rule against transgender litigants. Like, the decisions that come out of these courts are just, like, basically a lower court will say, yeah, that's pretty discriminatory. After you get the examples like we saw above, you know, and we just talked about where right. it's like, if you got barricaded in a hot shower with third degree burns, like, that's discrimination, right? And so lower courts have agreed. They've said, yeah, this is not good. You can't do this. You can't be discriminatory. You can't have government policies that hurt people like this. But the appeals courts have started to look back at these decisions and to say, <laughs> You know, actually, I got a different thought about that than what you did, and I think you're wrong. So these courts have been going back and overturning these cases. These cases have been appealed properly, right? So it's following the legal process, but it's really frustrating that these courts will be overruling what is a lot of wins for trans people on a lower level, yeah. but getting turned by simply like who the judges are on these courts, really changing the outcomes for a lot of people and a lot of litigants. This is also okay. despite, like, what we talked about last week with, like, Bostock v. Clayton County. That's the Supreme Court case yeah. that ruled that protections against sex discrimination included protections based on, like, against discrimination on your gender identity and your sexual orientation, right? Because if you discriminate against me because I'm a trans woman, what the conservative Neil Gorsuch, our excellent justice, wrote was that that's sex-based, right? Because you have to know my sex to be able to discriminate against me. You have to be expecting me to be a male assigned at birth, right? And then treating me differently based on the, you know, sex I present as, right? Which is female. And so that was called sex discrimination by the court, right? But these lower appeals courts aren't really concerned about that, right? They're not talking about Bostock. They're not really interested in that decision, and I think we can make a lot of ties to something like abortion and thinking about what's going on there, right? Where very similarly, lower courts and like 
sneaky states like Alabama and Texas and all these other mischievous places with lawyers start writing laws that they know are illegal, right? They'll write an abortion law that they know is illegal. They know it's unconstitutional to write that six-week ban, yeah. right? But they do it anyways, and they send it to court, right? And a lower court might rule in their favor. They might say, like, no go, you can't do that. That's discrimination. But a lot of these appeals courts with these Trump judges have all of a sudden started to say, I'll let it slide. You know, we'll see what it happens. You never know what yeah. the Supreme Court might say is what they're thinking, right? And so they basically just let this stuff sit. And they basically get to play around with people's lives and have a lot of fun at our expense, right? At normal, regular people's expense because they've got a political agenda. And they're really hoping that the Supreme Court takes up these cases and says, yeah, you're right, courts. Uh, this isn't discriminatory. You know, and they're trying like with abortion, to get the Supreme Court to overrule its precedent, to say, like, now we don't actually have to deal with that. So, I mean, how are you feeling, Lizzie? How, how, does, how does all that make you feel, thinking, like, we're trying to get up to the Supreme Court again? It's honestly incredibly frustrating, especially as, as someone who... I was just a couple of months ago living in Alabama, living with family, and I have family in Alabama. I have friends in Alabama. I'm... I'm I'm baffled and I am frustrated. Like, for example, I I don't want surgery, but that's me personally. And I know there are other people out there who, you know, are perfectly happy with just taking steps of of hormones, just perfectly happy taking steps of just taking changes to their their name and their clothes, their you know their wardrobe, like gender euphoria that's different from person to person and to try and force people to be like no you have to have surgery for that well are you going to pay for that surgery surgery is expensive well, no, no, no. they're free transgender surgeries for illegal aliens in prison not for alabamians evidently not yeah alabamians sorry yeah you're gonna have to pay for that one yourself and so, like, I also am not interested in surgery. Like, I'm really happy with my transition without surgery. And, like, if I am interested in surgery, it's not the surgery that Alabama wants me to get, right? And that's part of the problem, right? Is So, like, in Ohio, for example, where I live, mm -hmm. I had to go fill out paperwork. I had to pay for my new driver's license, you know? Like, it still costs money to get this stuff done. Yeah. That kind of sucks. I don't make the most money in the world, but... That's all right. I am privileged enough to be able to afford that and to be able to navigate the system. And I understand why, like, a $40 fee exists, right? We're paying for some people's jobs, and I would like the government to exist and to function. And so, like, some of that I'll take. But, like, asking for a, like, tens of thousands of dollars surgery that, like, in America, you don't have health care. It's not like we have the NHS, and it's not even like the NHS is supporting these surgeries. It's such a frustrating experience because it is very clearly saying that, like, oh, no, 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 the state is going to discriminate against you, and it's going to lock you into getting misgendered all the time. Like, imagine if you're just, like, a trans anybody who wants to go to the bar and not get, like awkwardly ID'd, right? Yeah. Even if you want to go through the effort of paying the state to fix your license and giving them all the paperwork accurately filled out, you know, and doing uh -huh. all that effort, they're still like, uh, can I see your surgeons now? Right. <laughs> Which and is it's, weird. It, that is so weird. Like, and obviously, like, already people were having issues where they're getting, they're losing their jobs, they're getting harmed and emotionally traumatized and everything. Also, say that, that this, this, becomes a thing where it's law who's to say what the the bar is of of what surgeries you have to have what's going to be enough surgery what's going to be oh that's not the right surgery like who is going to be arbitrarily deciding that for everybody in alabama yeah it's up to the state legislators which um I don't know. I really don't trust the people who are constantly being sued for violations of the Voting uh -huh. Rights Act for gerrymandering and discriminating against Black people and minorities in their districts. And so, like, we know that these people are not trustworthy people, especially on these issues. Yeah. Do you want to talk about some of the reasoning behind this? Because I think that's always fun. Like, as someone with a law degree, I may not practice law. So, again, no legal advice. <laughs> Anybody listening, it's not legal. <laughs> But they do what I call a real lawyer TM move of going, well, actually. And so they change what they're talking about, right? So the question is essentially like, does everybody have an equal protection like or an equal right to get your gender mm -hmm. ID updated, right? To have your gender ID accurately reflect your gender on your driver's license. Right. The court goes, actually, I've got a better question for you. That's not the question. The real question is that we all have the same right to get our sex assigned at birth on our ID, right? Technically, 
your gender identity is uh, irrelevant. It's not, that's not what's on there. It's your sex assigned at birth. And so it doesn't matter. And so they literally just changed the question. So the lower court had this other question. That's what the lawsuit was about. But we're just going to play semantics. We're just going to do the lawyer move of like rewriting it and pretending we're really smart because we just changed the question. It gives the same energy. There's a classic law school question uh, where there's a sign posted at the park, right? And it says, no vehicles in park. But if somebody's having a heart attack, should the ambulance stop outside the park and not go in? <sighs> no, the ambulance should probably fucking go in and save the person, right? And it's the same vibe as like, okay, well, no vehicles in park. That means no bikes in the park. You know, uh, no rollerblades in the park, no skateboard. And it's like, mm -hmm. if it's a skate park and it says no vehicles, like, I don't think they're talking about the skateboards, you know? Right. And so it's things like that where it's like, we, <laughs> we can't let these words control us. Yeah. Um, because they are just words at some point. But these courts are really willing to play with words to make things happen. The other thing they do is they scaremonger a lot. And so, Lizzie, I think you'll relate to this. Uh, you're talking about not having a gender, right? And yeah. like weird gender things. So what they say, and I'll quote here from a footnote, quote, and if an individual's gender identity vacillates throughout the day or is neither male nor female, then what, under the plaintiff's theory, could stop the Constitution from compelling on-demand licenses with new genders to suit every identity? End quote. So, like, Lizzie, do you want an on-demand driver's license? Like, you want to go in 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. to, like, get a new license? No! I, what, <laughs> here's what I want as someone who... who, who doesn't really feel like they have a gender but has like you know sometimes i might feel more masculine sometimes i might feel more more feminine i want a gender neutral marker for my id that is what i would absolutely love to see because that is my default that is how i feel like 99 percent of the time personally i feel like there should be at least a third option for gender neutral because, like, it's even proven scientifically that gender and sex are two completely different things. And it does have an impact on our mental health, which has an impact on our physical health. So you don't want 500 different markers on there? You just God's want, like, an no. X? God, I just, just put an, like, an X would be perfect, would be fantastic. It, I don't, I don't see why that would be so hard. Your passport can have an X on it as your gender <gasps> marker. You're, if you didn't know that, I did you not. can actually get an X gender marker on your passport in the United States. I did not know that. It's super cool, right? It's one of the few places. And there are some states that also give you an X gender marker, which again, super cool. Oh my gosh. I have a story from a trans friend. Marceline, if you're listening, love, love, love you so much. But in the UK, she's had issues with her X gender identity because the UK doesn't exactly like that it's an X marker. And their systems are like, you either give us an M or an F. And if you give me an X, you're nothing in the system. And it's like computers have trouble with mm. things like that because they haven't been properly updated to account for that. And it's, again, stuff where, like, we know with what the trans UK, there's been a lot going on in the UK, right? Yeah. And they're not exactly the kindest to trans folk and not exactly the most willing to update their systems to accommodate us even when it's a very simple change. So I will throw out that caution towards an X gender marker, but I do want to say like it's a real option and it doesn't have to cause major problems for things if governments are willing to do the minimal level of effort and accept their computer systems with an X, you know, it's, it's things like adding that. Adding one little option into your computer system. But that's, I, I did not know that was a thing. And now I have something to consider as someone who is trying to get their passport fixed after dealing with a name change. Yeah. So 100% an option for you. The other thing is like in, like with the passports and with the 28 states that like do allow you to change your gender marker oh. to an X, there hasn't been a demand for on-demand gender IDs, right? Nobody's suing no. to get their gender ID changed every single week or whatever, right? Like... If it needs to be updated, it needs to be updated. But like most trans people, I think are like other people in that we don't want to be at the DMV. No. I don't want to be there. <laughs> I don't want to give the government a bunch of money just to get my ID updated whenever I feel like yeah. it. Like, it can be one thing and that's fine. You know, we can pick from our list of three options. And I feel like most people can find something that they feel satisfied with and then not have to go to with the DMV every week. I agree. And like, because like I recently had to transfer my license from Alabama back to Oklahoma. And like, 
I had to sit there and wait. Like, I got there, like, early, like, right as it opened. And my uh, spot kept getting pushed down and pushed down and pushed down and pushed down on the waiting list. I was there for, like, an hour for what should have been, like, 10-minute wait. And so, like, I don't want to go to the DMV if I don't have to. I don't want to have to get my picture taken if I don't have to. I'm very camera shy, honestly. I have such a bad ID photo. I look so different. I didn't have bangs. It's not good. <laughs> the ID photos are absolutely always terrible. I don't want to have to deal with getting my photo taken regularly. I don't want IDs on demand. I just want a third gender neutral option, honestly. So trans people have reasonable request. Also, Lizzie, do you plan on suing the state to get a bunch of things done? Or does that seem like a lot of effort and you'd rather just like mind your business? <laughs> I would rather mind my business. Like if it was something that was like life threatening or like could really harm a lot of people, yeah, I would get in on something like that. But for the most part, I just want to be treated like a human being and to have equal rights and opportunities to everybody else. So we're just two trans people, but I think we've kind of narrowed down that this is kind of bullshit yes. <laughs> and that uh you know a forcing people to get a surgery that they may or may not want is weird strange behavior from the state and it's also like very costly to lock a gender id change behind for mm -hmm. no reason whatsoever because like they don't give a good justification for it obviously it's just like we don't have to and it's like yeah. that's not a good reason it begs the question of alabama why are y'all so obsessed with what's in people's pants? Good question. Uh, I don't think the DMV employees want to know that much. No. I think they'd like to just move on with their day. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. They they just want to they just want to do their job and like for you to go and so they can get to the next customer and get through their day. The downside of all this being at the Eleventh Circuit Court of Appeals means that it's a pretty high court, right? So the mm -hmm. only court above this is the Supreme Court of the United States, and the court doesn't take every single case, right? So this case may get appealed to the Supreme Court, but. I don't think the court's likely to take that specifically because the Supreme Court, fortunately or unfortunately, seems likely to decide whether trans people have a right to equal protection in the realm of health care later this term in a mm. case called U.S. v. Scrimetti. So this just, this case is a consolidated case of a variety of healthcare cases that mm -hmm. are essentially trans healthcare bans on minors and questioning whether or not uh, this violates the Equal Protection Clause. So the court's probably going to rule on this later this year with the decision. And that's both, like, I think somewhat hopeful that we get a good decision, but also very scary with the yeah. possibility of what could happen. Because right now, like we've kind of talked about a little bit, trans people sit in a weird spot, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have an equal protection right necessarily to like being not discriminated against based on trans status. Right. But trans status counts as sex discrimination right now, right? Mm -hmm. Under a different Supreme Court case. And so we're in this really weird middle ground where like in some places that are willing to protect us, like the Biden administration, for example, they're willing to use that Supreme Court case to like leverage their power and to push for more inclusive rights, for more inclusive policies and for more inclusive like applications of the law. But in other places, that uncertainty is being used to deny trans people care, right? right. Because the court hasn't said there's an equal protection right, the 11th Circuit gets to say, Ooh, I don't really know what's going on here. I'm just going to pass the buck and just say it's not illegal. And so it's a really tough spot to be in. But I think later this year, we're certainly going to talk about it. We're going to have uh, more to say about this topic. Absolutely. You mentioned this when we were talking about the show earlier, uh, conservatives again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> We got Republican attorneys general, so those are like the head lawyers of the state, right? Mm -hmm. The prosecutors, the big bad guys, threatening to sue the American Academy of Pediatrics. On September 24th, 2024, so two days ago prior to today when we are recording this, 22 Republican attorney generals, the head prosecutor or lawyer for a state, sent a letter to the American Academy of Pediatrics accusing them of violating consumer protection laws because of their endorsement of puberty blockers. Yeah, so... Huh. Fascinating stuff here. We've got reporting here from Aaron Reed, Aaron in the Morning on Substack. Very good follow, very good source for your trans news. What she links to is um, one of these Republicans uh, on Twitter sharing their letter because they are so proud of this letter, right? And so if I pop this letter open, it's basically a big statement that goes and uh, essentially says that people are violating uh, kids' rights by 
using puberty blockers, right? Where it says that it's actually harming kids. Let me get the quote here. So they say, quote, but when it comes to treating children diagnosed with gender dysphoria, the American Academy of Pediatrics has abandoned its commitment to sound medical judgment, end quote. Basically, they're like, there's no reason to do any of this like trans stuff you don't know what you're talking about and for all of our uk listeners this is a big one the cast review gets mentioned yeah so the lever like you all know what the cast review is i'm not going to explain it all that much but for our u.s listeners who don't know about the cast review a listen to what the trans uk and learn about the cast review they do a much better job than i'm going to do explaining it but b the cast review is a fundamentally flawed piece of research research in quotes i should say it's not much research but it's a fundamentally flawed document that essentially argues against transgender healthcare based on flawed science and a rather poor use of citations. And so it's very unfortunate that these Republican attorneys general have decided to heavily cite this letter, like, to the cast review. Like, it is literally the only citation that exists in the letter outside of them quoting the American Academy of Pediatrics mission. Which, okay, that. We all know quality work has two sources, one of which is the person you're making fun of, and the other of which is your friend. So <laughs> I am at a bit of a loss of words in terms of like what to even say when it comes to like, really, this is the quality of work we're doing? And this is 22 states that have signed on to this. Okay, so we have Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Missouri... Arizona, Iowa, Kansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Montana, Nebraska, North Dakota, Ohio, South Carolina, South Dakota, West Virginia, Texas, Utah, and Virginia. That is a very unfortunate smattering of states from all across our country. It really is. So this type of thing happens like low-key all the time where these Republicans like sign on to these letters. And like, in my opinion, they're pretty frivolous, right? Mm -hmm. But they also carry, like, a certain level of real threat in that, like, even if nothing comes of it, these motherfuckers wasted a ton of time and resources, right? Mm -hmm. They spent their staff's time doing this, right? Some level of attorneys were spending at least an hour doing this, and, like, they're getting paid by the state government and our taxpayer money to do this nonsense, which is, like, frustrating on its own level, mm -hmm. right? Second off, the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is, like— as far as I understand, a rather reputable organization doing good things for people, right. uh, helping people in a general sense, even if they're not a perfect organization, uh, they're wasting a ton of time and resources dealing with this, right? Yeah. Like, they have to respond to this. They have to, like, think about it because, like, literally 22 states are threatening to sue them for consumer protection violations under state law because they didn't follow the cast review. Again, something that is not from this country. It is fundamentally flawed. So... There's that. But then the other thing is, like, it's also designed to put pressure on them to not support trans kids, right? It's to make it so it's, like, by supporting trans kids, it's supposed to be too costly, you know? Yeah. Or even if you don't get sued, you still had to deal with this bullshit. And yeah. it's, like, that has a level of cost to it. I know this cost exists in other places, too. You see things like Elon Musk suing Media Matters, right? And then mm -hmm. Media Matters being forced to lay off a bunch of staff members because of that, to be able to yeah. afford the lawsuits. Even though we all know who's going to win that stupid lawsuit because it's not a real lawsuit, no. right? But the reality of the system is that our side oftentimes is under-resourced and has to take a lot of costs on to fight back. Unfortunately. I also said this is a bit of a, you know, transphobic, transatlantic cross-pollination. You know, we're just uh, <laughs> crossing the Atlantic Ocean with this trans stuff. And it's the, it goes both ways, right? Because yeah. I know the UK people have talked about the Heritage Foundation, which is a lovely United States organization doing all oh, kinds yeah. of things here. So lovely. All I have to say is, and this goes not just for, you know, how they hand, how conservatives cast review republicans you know just basically pe transphobic people it's not just in that but also in your abortion laws and and everything and how they're they're trying to control women's bodies that's exactly what it is it's trying to control things to fit their perfect little mold which is never going to work or happen it's all about control they don't care they say it's for the kids it's not for the kids it's for control 
They want to control women. They want to control people's bodies and their lives and tell them what they can and cannot do because it doesn't fit what they think is the perfect mold and the perfect version of people. Well, you bringing it back to abortion is so smart because it's the exact same thing, right? Because we're talking about consumer protection laws, right? So these are the laws that they're basically saying that it's dangerous to give kids puberty blockers, right? That's the argument they're making is that it's, you know, it's a malpractice. It's a, it's a medical danger to do that, right? To have hormones or to not to be doing the things that are not hormones, right? Right. And this is very similar to what we've seen with something like mifepristone, right? Which is the abortion right. pill and where Republican attorneys general are also saying that mifepristone is a violation of consumer protection laws, right? Where you are using this unsafe drug, right? Judge Matthew Kazmierich, who is the district court judge in Amarillo, Texas, um, he's a favorite of conservatives, a Trump appointee, right. um, and somebody who issues a lot of national injunctions from his courtroom, uses these type of laws all the time and these type of arguments. Like, he's the one who issued the Mifepristone injunction, trying to basically ban Mifepristone nationwide, saying that it's dangerous and that the FDA didn't actually approve it. Which... <laughs> is weird because, like, they did. did. And so it's, like, very frustrating that these people use their positions of power and use their taxpayer money to, like, really attempt to undermine decades' worth of work from advocates. Yeah. Speaking of decades' worth of effort, or really less than a decade's worth of effort, Russia has been funding anti-LGBTQ conservative personalities recently. In their latest kind of catch, right? The Department of Justice released an indictment alleging earlier this month that Russian conspiracy to influence the U.S. election was underway. Would you be surprised if I told you that anti-LGBTQ bigots like Tim Pool were caught up in this mess? Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm surprised that it's one a thing, but also like not surprised it's been a thing, but I'm, I'm, I'm more surprised that someone actually finally got caught on it. I think that's where my surprise comes from. The indictment alleges that two RT employees covertly financed and influenced Tenet Media to a grand sum of nearly $10 million over the last year alone, right? So $10 million in a year is a lot of money to go to That's... one place. And so wow. RT is state-owned media, right? It used to be, like, have Russia in the name of it, but they changed it, you know, got to be a little sneaky. Mm. Not that sneaky. They're still registered foreign agents, right? And so they're not legally allowed to be engaging with, like, United States media, right? So Tenet Media is an ostensibly American company, right? They were founded in Tennessee by some former members of The Blaze. Um, if you don't know The Blaze, they're a conservative media outlet that is uh, known for being full of bigots and full of other nonsense. Um, oh. So former Blaze employees started Tenet Media, but allegedly, according to this indictment, RT employees were actually financing and influencing the operations of Tenet Media illegally. And again, $10 million for a media operation is a lot for a year. That is a lot. I'm going to go on a limb and say that what the trans has not made $10 million. Uh, definitely not. I'll also be clear and say that, like, Tim Pool is not indicted, right? They're not indicting Tim Pool saying that Tim Pool, like, took a check from Russia, right? What they're saying is that we don't know if Tim Pool knew he was taking money from the Russians. But honestly, why don't we just listen to Tim Pool? I think it's going to be better if we hear from him directly on this issue instead of me just trying to say what he thinks. Let's go for it. Joining us on the line right now is Tim Pool. He is host of TimCast IRL, a CEO of TimCast.com and host of the Culture War podcast. You can see that over at his YouTube channel. Tim, thanks for joining the show. Great to talk to you. Thanks for having me. Given the media coverage, I think the, the, the question that, that people in the media are pushing, at least, is the idea that there must have been some sort of outside external Russian control of your show. Maybe you want to address how you do the editorial at your show. I mean, the Culture War show is a conversation show on various topics. The subject matter of the show editorially is there's no thought into it. It's kind of crazy to hear that they're saying uh, the, the media has jumped the gun completely on what the story is. The DOJ indictment literally says that commentators were deceived, that there was a rather uh, sophisticated plan to manipulate the commentators of the platform so that they wouldn't know what was going on. And I can say on my end, you know, everything that, go that happens here goes through our legal team, and we have multiple lawyers. And so when someone reaches out to us, I say, great, cool, uh, someone handle it and talk to the lawyers. The lawyers come back, do, do, do their due diligence, and then we say, sure, or whatever. We only ever took money from an American corporation 
the the amount of money that we were offered for the show was around market value for offers we had already received. And the crazy thing is, you know, assuming all this stuff is true, I'm like, man, this sucks. We, we, we didn't need the deal. The deal didn't do anything for us. It was just, sure, I guess. And the bummer is now with everything, with the way things are going, we could have just run the culture war on my channel with 1.3 million subscribers as it is. And just made money on our own through sponsors as, as, as we already did. So it's it's frustrating to get entangled in whatever whatever it is she's accused of being involved in. So yeah, that's Tim's take on it, right? He doesn't put any thought into the content that he produces. There's literally no thought into it. That shows. <laughs> right, so again, like I caught that clip because he rambled. That was a 20 minute like interview and he says the same thing the entire 20 minutes. Oh, sounds like my ex. <laughs> So Tim's main points, right? He got deceived, right? He was bamboozled. He was swindled. He was deceived. That's point number one. Point number two, he doesn't think about what he puts out in his content. He just makes things. And that that doesn't matter, right? And so it couldn't have been Russian influence. He just makes things. Number three, he only took money from an American company, right? And he didn't take money from the Russians directly. It was all through an American company. And number four, his lawyers said it was okay. So... That's what we have here, right? That's Tim's kind of take on it. So the level-headed take on this is that it sounds like he's saying essentially what was advised to him to say by lawyers, you know, not really taking any responsibility for it, but also not admitting any fault to anything. That's the thing is he's not admit he's not taking any responsibility. And clearly he's not thinking. <laughs> it is no thought. It is just word vomit. And um, honestly, like, Tim Pool is now in the category, in my mind, of, oh, look, another cis-het white man shitting out of his mouth instead of his ass and just has a mic. And we have way too much of, of that, in my opinion. Which is why this is a trans-only podcast. Hey! <laughs> Anyways, uh, I, personally... I think Tim, like, misses the point yeah. of propaganda and, like, why Russia's funding him, mm -hmm. right? So I've taken classes on corruption in law school, right? That doesn't make me a corruption expert or anything like that. But, like, the point of corruption is not, like, peddling influence like this is not necessarily money, right? Like, the point is not about Tim getting a check that says, with love, flatty, you know? Right. And, like, hearts and XOXO, you know, all cutesy. Like, that, you don't have to get a check from Vladimir Putin, right? Yeah, we'll just save those checks with those notes for Trump. <laughs> Tim is useful to Vladimir's goals simply by being Tim Pool. Right. And, like, to me, that says a lot about Tim and the content that he's making. Right. That says way more about what you're doing and what you're putting out there and your own values than it does about like whether or not you knew it was Russia. Right. Because that's mm -hmm. not the point. The point is you're doing shit that is useful to an enemy of the state. Uh -huh. And like uh, they like it. They like it so much that they're going to work to deceive you and give you a bunch of money so that you can keep doing it. Like, I don't know. I'm not getting a lot of checks here. I'm not getting suspicious American media companies offering me a hundred grand an episode to license out my content, you know? Like, ordinarily, I would say, you know, go get that money, get that check. But, like, <laughs> you've got to have a moral, like, compass when you're, like, in that realm of things, honestly. And he clearly does not have one. And in some of the clipped out stuff that, like, I didn't include, it's stuff like him talking about how he did a show on skateboarding, you know? And that's what one of the ones they paid $100,000 for, you know? An mm -hmm. episode about skateboarding. They don't talk about politics when they talk about skateboarding. They also talk about religion in some episodes. And they're like, that's not politics. There's also an episode about Ukraine. But, like... Hmm. And so, <laughs> again... We're not saying that Tim Pool got a check from Russia to be against Ukraine. Tim Pool has stated that he's against Ukraine for his own principled reasons, right? And right. doesn't think we should be spending money over there. But it just so happens to be something that you say that gets you checks from the Russians. Yeah. I, even if you don't know that it's from the Russians. And, like, it's just, like, one of those where, like, we talked about last week, right, where... It's hard to keep up with how much anti-trans stuff is going on in the U.S. Mm -hmm. because one of these sides has a lot of fucking money all the time, yeah. and the other side doesn't ever have any money to talk about things. We're struggling out here. Literally, and so we get into this terrible scenario where, again, these people just doing their shit, being Tim Pool, right? He's making a hundred thousand dollars an episode. <laughs> 
from the Russians without even knowing it, just for being himself. And we're not making $100,000 an episode just for being ourselves. We wish. We wish. <laughs> I'll also toss in another fun thing is that, of course, Elon Musk was sharing Tenet Media stuff on Twitter uh, throughout the past year. And so, again, Elon's probably not getting paid by the Russians directly or anything like that. But he's certainly not smart enough to know that he's sharing Russian propaganda on his website. Color me, not surprised. Somebody has too much of an issue with his trans children to deal with it. Uh-huh. That's why we will never stop dead naming Twitter. X is for gender markers. I, yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love that. X is for gender markers. Can I have that like on a t-shirt, stickers, hat? I think that's a good one. Uh, as serious as it is that like, wow, these people are getting paid money. Um, There's not a whole time we can do about it, right? We can't do much to stop them because again like tim said he's doing this stuff on his own right yeah. tim wants to talk about this stuff and he wants to be a bigot for his own purposes and it just so happens to align with the interests of wealthy foreign powers uh. i think we can shift a little bit towards our final section now we've got triple trans joy to end things on mm -hmm. which i think is a lot of fun but i'll be cool and transition as well by talking about something that doesn't seem to be working which is Russians spending a bunch of money on anti-LGBTQ issues because, like, it's kind of a big stinker to be anti-trans in the U.S. and to be anti-gay. Like, it's just not that popular. So we've got a fun Fox News poll here, right, that shows that voters trust Kamala Harris more than Donald Trump on transgender issues, which, womp womp, big surprise, 56% to 40%. And so, again, huh. this is of Fox News polling, right? Fox does not have the most accurate polls in the world. No. But it's not because they lean liberal. <laughs> no. And so it's rather telling that when Fox is polling their set of people that they poll, right, their selected demographics, their audience, even they, to a 56 to 40 margin, say that they trust Kamala Harris on trans issues more than Donald Trump. Which I think just shows how much of, like, a losing issue being an anti-LGBTQ bigot is. Like, yeah. people don't really care that much that we're trans and they're kind of just, like, would like us to be able to live our lives like other people. Which, again, hey, governments, why do you care so much about what's in our pants? You know, a reoccurring theme of this episode, and I think many trans episodes, is why are you asking that question? Right? <laughs> Similarly... Uh, Michigan had a pretty big one, right? So Michigan recently banned the gay and trans panic defense. So this is a kind of big historic move because one of the like unfortunate realities has been that when people commit a crime, one of the defenses that people have tried and sometimes successfully raised, it's a bit hard to like get all the sources and all the research on this, is that that they were, say, like, going to sleep with somebody, right? They thought there was a woman. Uh, it happens to be a trans woman. They panic, they assault, they batter, they might even kill that person. Right. But they claim in court that they're not at fault because they panicked because it was a trans person or they panicked because it was a gay person. And, like, they don't identify that way or whatever. And so that justifies their crime, right? That absolves them of harming that other person, that other human being. I don't know about you, Z, but I think that's pretty awful and doesn't make a lot of sense that somebody can just, like, claim to, you know, get away with assault for free. It really does. It's – there is no excuse for taking a life except for in, I feel, self-defense or in defending somebody who cannot defend themselves. Like, if, say, you saw some random person beating on another person and that person is, like – knocked out and like you defend them and something happens and like boom they 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 die like they fall they hit their head they die or like say someone is attacking you you defend yourself the other person doesn't live but you do because you defended yourself it's that's the only way i could see of taking somebody else's life being acceptable because it's not like you set out to take somebody's life in that type of situation honestly like i feel like the whole gay panic thing it's I don't care if you panic. Your reaction should absolutely never be to harm somebody. It should never be to take somebody's life. Taking somebody's life has more of an impact, not just on yourself than you might be willing to admit, but also it has an impact on communities, on loved ones. It's It has a long-lasting and long-reaching impact. And that's why we have people who died 
centuries ago, we still know who they are. We still know how they were killed because deaths have a long lasting impact. People who are killed, their deaths have a long lasting historical impact. And I, I, I'm getting into a tangent rant. That's probably not yeah. making sense, but basically panic is never a viable reason for taking somebody's life. Personally, in my opinion, I think a lot of these defenses are after the fact justifications for something that already happened, right? Yes. It's a lot of the time where like, you might regret who you slept with. You know, you might have internalized transphobia, internalized homophobia that make you feel some type of way after you've already done something, after you've already committed to this. And like, I'm not here to tell you that you can't feel weird ways about sex, right? Like, I have had sex before that I did not enjoy, right? Yeah. But I didn't kill that person. I didn't hurt them. I didn't harm them, you know? And it's like you said, Lizzie, about taking the appropriate responses, where, like, even if you are going to panic, there are ways to do that that are not going to harm other people. Yeah. And I think it's just such a, a big point that Michigan has taken the step of outlawing this defense and making it so that it's not a thing that can happen in Michigan. And it just brings up a, hey, uh, get therapy, folks. Work on those panic responses. And work on your internalized homophobia and transphobia. Like, like, get over yourself. That's a pretty good way to, I think, segue into our last topic. Let's talk about something fun and exciting for real, for real. Lizzie? Ah, I feel put on the spot. But I did bring this up, so I kind of brought this on myself. And I did edit the document to add this in there. A um, little bit of personal joy on this one. Um, I am in a competition called Face of Horror, um, which has a really, really cool opportunity of being a, a chance to meet Kane Hodder. Um, so if you're a horror fan, you know who that is. Every day you get a uh, you can cast a vote for free. It goes through f their website through Facebook. Um, so you have to have a Facebook account in order to cast a free vote. But also there are donation votes where it is a dollar for a donation. And it goes to Starlight Children's Foundation, which does a lot of great work for kids in hospitals right now. Um, I am going to be in the next round, which will be the top 10 for my bracket. Eventually the brackets will converge. There's a lot more rounds to come. Um, but I am currently third in my bracket. Um, I'm super excited, but I'm excited. I'm going to be in top 10 on that. By the time this comes out, uh, that top 10 round will be going on. It starts literally in four hours from now. I'm nervous <laughs> rambling. Um, I can't believe I've made it this far. But basically, if you are willing to go and cast at least a free vote for me, I would greatly appreciate that. I, I post it on my, my Twitter every day, my Instagram, my threads. Um, the link is faceofhorror.org forward slash 2024 forward slash Lizzie, L-I-Z-Z-I-E, little hyphen dash Mackenzie, M-C-K-E-N-Z-I-E. Um, if you are willing to at least cast a free vote for me once every 24 hours, um, my listeners, you guys, I would absolutely appreciate that. I'm not going to beg you guys to like spend money on me. Um, but if you do, it does go to a really, really great organization, a really great cause. And those donations are 100% tax deductible. Deductible. Thank you. <laughs> the anxiety is real right now because I'm talking about myself. <laughs> Yeah, well, lots of love to you, Lizzie. We know you're going to do great, and we know Thank we're going to support you. And this, and that link will be in the description slash show notes as well, Yay. so you don't have to listen like we're on the phone or the radio telling you something. Um, <laughs> Could have told me that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason I didn't read all the source links. <laughs> also, if you, as a viewer, do you have trans joy? You should share it with us. We want to share your trans joy. So please reach out to us on Discord. I know I'm in the What the Trans Discord as Clementine or Suzaka. Um, so it's my face. It's pretty. I don't know. Click on me. Send me a DM with your trans joy. Um, that'd be cool. Or you can message Callie or any of the other ones of us who are in the Discord and we'll yeah. get it to the right spot. I'm also in the trans. I should be in the What the Trans Discord now. Um, I'm in there as Lizard Breath 95 or Lizzie. So you can also send me a message as well. I think all of us are in there by now. We should all be in there. Be. Uh, Valeria and Ketza aren't here today with us, but I think they're in the, the trans Discord and they will respond too. So 
Shoot some in our way. Uh, lots of love to you all. And thank you so much today for listening to What the Trans USA, episode six. Woo-hoo! Today's script was written by Clementine. That's me. It was also presented by me, Clementine again, and Lizzie. Our music was composed by Waritza Yui Carlberg. And our Patreon producers are Danny Gold, Lex Phoenix, Sebastian Singh Soprano, Joe the Low Quality Envy. Andrea Brooks, Jack Edwards, Emily Roberts, Dulce, Stephen Blackmore, Nuarte, Needles and Threads, Flaming Daphne, Dr. McGee, Genevieve Dickinson, Rachel Harris, Katie Reynolds, Georgia Holden Burnett, Grabalicious, Mix Affin, Root Minus One, Gray, Elizabeth Anderson, Bernice Roust, Ellen Mellor, Jay Hoskins, Trowen, Ashley, Maddie B, Setcab, Jane, Roberto DePrunk, Rose Absolute, Sarah, Sina, Kiki T, D, Sky Keelane, Eric Widman, B, Jude, Monsieur Squirrel, Fergus Evans, Anubis is a Jackal, Kamina, Brandon Craig, Break the System, Cyan Phillips, Heidi Reardon, Ezra, Lentil, Clara Vulliami, Amelia, Corvina Ravenheart, the Transmetal DJ from Twitch and VR chat, will play Saint Lucifer for props. Tabitha Joe Cox, aka Candy, Fiona McDonnell, Murgatroyd, Ontologically Unjust, Stella, Cinder Goza, Rebecca Prentice. I hope you're ready for this one. I hope you're ready for this one. I've practiced. <laughs> Crazy Richard! Dan Oblivion. Florence Stanley. Helen. Ellie Hollingsworth. Nick Ross. Melody Nix. Fiona Punchard. John. Nick Duffy. C.D. Bailey. Gordon Cameron. Ted Delphos. Kai Lewin. Vic Parsons. Patreon user. Vic Kelly. Catherine. Sabrina McVeigh. Cassius Adair. Melissa Brooks. Karakin 12. April Heller. Sophie Lewis. Alexandra Lilly. Claire Scott. Ariadna Pena. Lauren O'Neons. Bernard's Pink Jelly Bean. Lanos. And last but not least, Chris Hubley. Thank you all so much to our lovely patrons. We love you so much. We did it. We survived. Woo! We look forward to hearing you on the next episode of What the Trans USA. Woo-hoo! Goodbye. Bye. I love you guys.